Welcome to another edition of Crime News with Mark Solomon. It's Thursday, September 30, 2021, and today we're going to be talking a little bit about the Brian Landry manhunt, a little bit of the legal things I wanted to explain, things that are going on that don't seem immediately apparent, but I think you should know about. We're also going to be talking a little bit about the new arrest in the Brian Morphy case, and I'm going to talk about one thing that um, hits close to my old home, the Colonial Parkway's murder. Stay tuned. But before we get to that, don't forget to click like if you're enjoying this video. It really helps the channel. I really appreciate it if you do that. Let's go ahead and get to it. This just in, in the Chad Daybell case in Idaho, just yesterday, a, a hearing was scheduled for this morning at 10 a.m. The prosecutor was asking the court to consider the sequestration of the jury. Motion by the defense to change the venue in the hearing that just happened two hours ago, the prosecutor is not objecting to a change of venue, but wants the trial held in Fremont County, quote, for a lot of reasons, including a fair trial. The judge said that since the new motion relates to a change in venue, he will allow it to be heard during next Tuesday's hearing, but he said that he can make a decision. He needs facts and the cost of bringing a jury to Fremont County compared to holding it in another county. Remember, anytime there's a trial that's gotten so much national publicity as this one, the judge has got to weigh all the different options of having a trial in the place where the actual crime occurred versus moving it from an, from their county to another venue. And then in this case, the prosecutor's talking about bringing in the jurors from the original jurisdiction. And there's always a cost of that. And if they get a motion to sequester granted, that means that the jury is not going home during their deliberation. So in other words, if they can't make a decision in weeks or months of deciding or of trying to decide the case, they will stay away from their family and friends and they will be trapped trying to decide this case. Is that fair? I don't know. I think from the defendant's point of view, it's got to be a one way to try to guarantee a fair trial. But on the other hand, um, is it fair to the jurors themselves? What do you think? I'd love to know. Put your, put your thoughts in the comments below. So, Brian Landry, my original thought and what I wanted to do this video on was saying something like, being a fugitive is not illegal and it's not it's not illegal to be a fugitive however if you leave the state and go to another state like what might have happened here newsweek article brian landry may have escaped the warrant on a cruise ship or a plane says an ex-fbi agent links to this are in the description just remember um, if you are a fugitive within a state, I don't know of a single state that has a law that makes it illegal to be a fugitive. In other words, if you're not being prosecuted because you haven't been arrested yet, just not being arrested is not a problem. I have clients all the time saying I have a warrant that's years old. I have a warrant that was enacted a month ago. Heck, during the pandemic, I had a client who was trying to turn himself in for, I think, three or four weeks in the jail. And the deputies kept saying, no, we're full. Come back next week. That's not illegal. What is illegal, on the other hand, is being a federal fugitive and crossing interstate lines. 18 U.S.C. 1073, flight to avoid prosecution or giving testimony. And this makes it an absolute crime if you evade a warrant, a federal warrant, by leaving the state, crossing state lines, or in this particular case with Brian Landry, may have left the country. Uh, that is definitely adding things onto a problem that he does not need. Remember, last week, what happened when the Federal Bureau of Investigation got a warrant for him for the credit card fraud, that gave him a federal case. And by leaving the state to avoid it, now granted, they'd have to know that he knew about that case. I don't think that'd be too hard at this point with all the media coverage. He would be breaking another law, which gives him another right to get another charge, another grand jury indictment. So that's not good for him. One of the things that keeps coming up in the comments, people have commented, I've talked to family and friends about this case, and half of the people say that Brian Landry's family should be charged. Some people say yes, some people say know i'd love to hear what you'd like to what you think should happen let me know in the comments below but if they had anything to do with helping him that is absolutely another crime 
an accessory after the fact. This is generally in a lot of states. I know Colorado is one of them. Um, this is where a person who assists somebody with the intent to help the person avoid arrest or punishment. So in other words, if Brian Landry's family, knowing that he was going to be arrested or punished, helped him evade capture, that would make them guilty of this crime. Of course, the state would have to prove that. And if the feds wanted to charge him, they could do that as well. Interesting and not good news for the Landry family, potentially. Okay, next thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was the new arrest in the Barry Morphew case. Shoshana Dark was arrested because she allegedly trespassed at the former home of Barry Morphew. According to the surveillance cameras, the police say she went on the property and removed a package from the front step, which is trespassing. She's been arrested. Not sure how that's going to affect the rest of the case or if she's going to be tied into anything else. How did she know to go there? Was he in contact with her? Was, are there other charges coming? We don't know at this point, but we'll stay tuned on that one. The last thing I wanted to talk about today is just a tickler into a new subject we haven't talked about before. This is the Colonial Parkway murders. These, these started in Southeast Virginia, where I grew up back in the mid to late eighties and nobody has solved them. So far, there are six cases tied to that. Let's take a little look about what that case is about. I found this really good synopsis here on crimemuseum.org. It talks about the Colonial Parkways, how originally started in October 12 of 1986, Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski. They were apparently murdered near their car. These were two women. Kathy Thomas was a 27-year-old graduate of the Naval Academy who was apparently dating Rebecca Dowski, a student at the College of William and Mary, which was less than 15 minutes from there. The next couple that was killed was David Nobling and Robin Edward in September 22 of 1987. Another young couple found along the banks of the James River in Virginia, and they were tied to the same basic area. Another couple, Cassandra Haley and Richard Call, April 10, 1988, Christopher Newport University students. And Richard's car was found about two miles away from where the bodies had been discovered. And the last couple was Daniel Lauer and Anna Maria Phelps, which is about a year and a half later. And they were on their way to Virginia Beach and they were reported missing when their car was found abandoned in New Kent on I-64. That's Interstate 64. And the interesting thing there was their bodies were found about a month later on October 19th by hunters on an old logging road. There have been speculation that where they were eventually found couldn't have been done by anybody who hadn't previously known about that logging road in the area where the bodies were found. Now, Having personal ties to this general area, I've ridden on the Colonial Parkway a lot, and I've talked to a lot of people who are involved in law enforcement both at the time and since. I've talked to a college professor who was telling me about how he was convinced he knew who the murderer was and that the murders ended when that particular person left the country. I also talked to somebody who worked for the park ranger service at the time, and they were convinced that this was somebody who might have been somebody in their employment. Interestingly enough, nobody has found out what's been going on, and even still, it's been 30 years, and there have been a number of YouTube videos. There's been a number of news media coverage on the subject. If you would like me to go deeper into the subject, please let me know in the comments. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. Was this somebody inside law enforcement? Was it somebody posing as a law enforcement officer? These Lover's Lane's murders are still unsolved, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. So that's what I've got for you today. If you've got any thoughts, feelings, comments, I'd love to hear what you have to say in the comments below. And until then, thank you so much for watching.